Dr. Stephen Gundry is the author of the bestseller, The Plant Paradox, and he's mainly become known for his ideas about the dangers of lectins. Over the years, I've gotten a lot of requests from you guys to comment on or to fact check Dr. Gundry's ideas, Dr. Gundry's claims. And recently, he went on a podcast where they ended up doing exactly that. This is a podcast hosted by Dr. Mike, who has a large YouTube channel. And so he had on Dr. Gundry, and he also had on a board-certified cardiologist, Dr. Danielle Bellardo, to give more context to the conversation. Honestly, when I saw this setup, I was pretty surprised that Dr. Gundry even accepted to go on. In my experience, from what I've seen from Dr. Gundry's messages and content on social media, it's not very compelling. It's not based on strong scientific evidence. There's a lot of storytelling. And so this type of message does really well on podcasts where the host is not a scientist, is not really uh, equipped to challenge anything and just is kind of floored by every sensationalist claim. But in a setup like this, talking to two other doctors, I thought that Dr. Gundry and Dr. Gundry's ideas might get a lot of pushback. And that's exactly what ended up happening. For almost two hours, Dr. Gundry would make a claim and he made some of the wildest claims I've ever heard on social media. And that's a pretty high bar. And in real time, he would get fact-checked, usually by Dr. Bellardo, sometimes by Dr. Mike, to some extent. But the conversation was always very polite, professional, no yelling or name-calling or anything like that. So it's the only way to do it. Now, the dynamic of that conversation made clear some patterns in how Dr. Gundry communicates with the public that are pretty typical of content that we see on social media that isn't very evidence-based. Uh, let's call them red flags. And once you see them, it becomes pretty easy to spot them, no matter who does it. So we'll take a look at the main ones, and we'll show examples of Dr. Gundry doing it almost like a case study. Now, obviously, we're going to look at scientific claims, scientific ideas. We're not going to do any personal attacks, no ad hominems. If we're all going to learn and move this forward, we have to be able to do this. We have to dissect ideas and criticize ideas and disagree with ideas without attacking the person and their character and their intentions. I mean, that's literally how science works. By the way, we reached out to Dr. Gundry and his team in case they want to comment or discuss any of it or come on at any time. I explained that I disagree with some of Dr. Gundry's views, but that this was going to be perfectly cordial. Uh, we haven't heard back and it's been quite a while. So I, I imagine there will be no response. But if there is any correspondence before this goes live, we'll make sure to include it in the video. So the first red flag is stating pet theories as fact. Throughout the conversation, Dr. Gundry does this numerous times. He has an idea, he has a hypothesis, and he presents it like it's established truth. And this is something that honestly kind of blew me away because Due to that format that I talked about, I thought Dr. Gundry might tone down his usual style. Man, was I wrong. If anything, he turned it up. Right out of the gate, he came out with this claim that some of the inhabitants of the Blue Zones are long-lived, live longer, because they smoke. What makes them have longevity is the men, 95% of the men smoke. The men in Sardinia have seven year longer lifespan than the women because they're smokers. Let's just make a key distinction here. Hypothesizing that smoking might have a benefit is not unscientific. Asking questions is not unscientific. In fact, the beauty of science is that not only is it okay, but it encourages questions that are provocative and countercurrent. So all of that is completely fine. This isn't about um, being open-minded or, oh, we can't challenge the establishment. None of that. This is about not making inaccurate statements that are not supported by the evidence and that mislead the public. Now, Dr. Gundry did not say, everybody go smoke. He even said, I don't smoke and I don't recommend people do. But that was after he made this sensational claim based on nothing compelling scientifically that confuses people. So the point is not that Dr. Gundry recommended smoking. It's not that. 
I don't want to misrepresent him. We're talking about making inaccurate scientific claims, taking an idea, taking a hypothesis, and stating it as fact. That's the red flag. In the wake of that show, I got multiple comments and messages from people saying, hey, it turns out that smoking is not so bad after all. I heard Dr. Gundry say it. So some people are extremely trusting and they will believe and even repeat what an influencer says uh, without scrutiny, without asking for evidence. So we have to be very careful and try to be responsible with how we communicate. And this is a dilemma that we have with scientific communication in general. Scientific thinking and scientific speaking are usually very cautious. Scientists will say things like, we tested this and the results indicate that, but we haven't really checked this other thing yet. It's possible that this. So everything is very qualified, almost fearful. And popular influencers are often the mirror opposite. Everything is very categorical, very black and white. Foods are either poison or superfoods. There's no middle ground. Absolute unshakable confidence. And the truth is the public often sees this style of communication as being more confident and even more knowledgeable. Like the person just seems like they know what they're talking about. All right. The second red flag is basing scientific arguments on the lowest tiers of evidence. So basically focusing on the weakest scientific evidence available and ignoring the strongest data out there. Okay, how can you possibly tell if you're not a scientist or not a specialist in a given area? How can you know if the person is talking about weak evidence or strong evidence? Actually, it's surprisingly easy to spot. Let's say I want to figure out the health effect of some food. Pistachios, for example. I can start out by asking around. Ask my neighbor, ask my cousin, and they tell me, yeah, I like pistachios. I started eating more a while back and I felt pretty good. I think I lost some weight around that time and I had this thing on my back and it went away. This type of anecdotal accounts are interesting. They're not useless, but the level of confidence in terms of cause and effect is very low. None of the changes are properly documented. There are many variables. Lots of other things happen at the same time. There's no control group. There's something called the placebo effect. When we expect something to be good or bad, we tend to feel accordingly and we tend to psychologically attribute those feelings to the new practice. So there's just a lot of moving parts to anecdotes. Okay, so we go up a level and we go into the lab and we actually run a controlled scientific experiment. We give pistachios to rats in cages, for example, or we take a nutrient from the pistachios, we concentrate it and we give it to the rats and we watch what happens to their health. This type of lab experiment, sometimes referred to as mechanistic data, also includes things like test tube data, cell culture data. They're interesting. They're actually really important. They're an important part of the body of evidence. It's just a big leap from that to the effect in humans. I think everybody understands that. So we go another level up and we're looking at humans and it's a proper documented scientific report. We find a population somewhere in an island that consumes a lot of pistachios, three or four times more than the average New Yorker. And we compare the health of the two populations. This is called ecological data. Another example are the blue zones that Dr. Gundry brought up. Really interesting, fascinating actually. Again, very low level of confidence in terms of cause and effect of the pistachios specifically because there's a thousand variables. Genetics are completely different. Pollution, junk food intake, physical activity, literally a thousand variables. All right, so we go up another level. We're almost done. We look at a population of people living in the same region. So we have much more homogeneity than our island to New Yorker comparison. And within that population, we look at the people who eat the most pistachios and the people who eat the least. So we have a reference and then we follow them over time for years and years. So it's a prospective study and we document all their outcomes. We actually get blood work and we have doctors following them and registering everything, who gets a heart attack, who gets cancer, who gets diabetes, who dies, etc. And also if there's any other differences between these people, if one of the groups smokes more or exercises less, we include all those factors in our analysis. So we try to minimize all those other variables. We try to isolate as much as possible this pistachio intake variable that we're interested in. So this is called a cohort study. And 
it's stronger than anything else we've looked at so far because there's more of an effort to isolate one variable. Is it perfect? Nope. Can we do even better? Yeah, take a group of people, split them randomly, give pistachios to half of them, follow them over time, see what happens to their health. That's called a randomized trial, and all else held equal, it's stronger than anything so far because the randomization does a better job of averaging out all the other differences other than the pistachios. So this idea is what we call the hierarchy of evidence. Obviously, I'm simplifying here. There's more rungs to this. You can have a randomized trial that's poorly designed, and so we give it less weight. So it's not cookie cutter, but just this concept that scientific studies aren't all created equal. A study in rats in cages or in a test tube versus a randomized trial in humans or a meta-analysis of 20 randomized trials in humans. Yeah, technically they're all studies, but scientifically it's night and day. And neither one is perfect, neither one is useless, none of these exaggerations, but there's a monumental difference in terms of the confidence level that they afford. So this is our second red flag, and this is so crucial. If you understand this, it will clarify so much of the confusing content out there. In science, we're always trying to go to the top. We're always trying to get stronger and stronger evidence for or against a hypothesis. We're trying to figure out, is this true or not? And the opposite of that would be falling to the bottom of this hierarchy, and so relying on a lot of anecdotes, ecological data, and mechanisms, which is something that's pretty common to see on social media. We don't need to exaggerate. Somebody mentioned an anecdote once, doesn't make this person terrible. It's totally fine to illustrate something. And also, anecdotes are not useless. They're actually important sources of ideas that we can then test in stronger experimental designs. So the problem is just avoiding these overarching confident claims based on evidence that doesn't justify it. So we see this dynamic on the podcast. Once you understand this, it's really interesting. And you can see this in real time. Dr. Ballardo constantly trying to pull the conversation to the top and Dr. Gundry constantly pulling to the bottom. There are a couple of exceptions. I don't want to misrepresent Dr. Gundry at one or two points, especially later in the conversation. He does point to a randomized trial or two, but overwhelmingly when pressed for evidence, he goes to anecdotes, ecological data, and mechanisms. Give you another example. Joseph Mercola recently has gone on kind of on a high fruit kick. And he says, Man, I feel so much better. All I do is eat fruit all day long. I mean, I don't care what but, someone says. Wait a minute. And then he says, Hey, but wait a minute. I notice that when I'm really going crazy on fruit, my triglycerides start going through the roof. And my insulin starts going through the roof. I just don't know what to do with that because it's not generalizable what Dr. McCola does or doesn't do with his insulin. It's not a In one of the most stunning moments of the entire conversation, Dr. Gundry admits in so many words that he knows, he recognizes that these types of evidence are not very reliable. Is there research that backs up where if you change someone's diet to have high vitamin C content, there negates their risk of smoking? Because I've never seen that. Yeah, that's all been done in the Blue Zones. Do you think that the Blue Zone project is a valuable thing for us to look at as a form of evidence? Uh, no. And this is something that we see quite often on social media, although it'll rarely be this obvious. But somebody will bring up a study to make a point, and then sometime later, we'll reject that same level of evidence as junk science or some label like that when it doesn't support their ideas. Pretty common to see that on social media. Now, before we go to the third and last red flag, I just want to point out something that I think that show, that podcast, makes very clear. And this is something that I've argued here before a number of times. And I know a number of you guys disagree with me, which is completely fine and actually super healthy. And that is the danger, in my view, of dismissing people and their ideas based on credentials. I see this type of comment all the time. So-and-so is just a chiropractor, so why would I care about anything he says about medicine or nutrition or heart disease or whatever it may be? So-and-so is not even an MD, so who cares what he or she says? Obviously, somebody could have little or no training in a given area, and they could still be absolutely right. They could be pointing to strong evidence. So we don't want to dismiss people and their views 
strictly based on resumes. But an even more dangerous side of this is that MDs and PhDs can be completely wrong. And when we have this entire world view that's based on credentials, our entire judgment is based on that. It's almost like we're on Tinder. MD, swipe right, not MD, swipe left. What do we do when an MD or a PhD or both comes along and makes an argument that is not scientifically sound? Dr. Gundry is a medical doctor, cardiovascular surgeon, Yale graduate. If he makes a claim that is not evidence-based, we don't have a defense system. We have no judgment. And then we tend to fall into this, well, he's got the credentials. He should know that's not critical thinking. So we have to develop more skills. We have to develop something stronger. We have to pay more attention to the actual arguments that people are making and the evidence they have to back it up. Okay, the third red flag is a grandiosity complex that everybody else is too blind to see the truth or too corrupt to give it to you. And the influencer alone is this Isaac Newton level genius that can see it and deliver it to you. If an idea had strong scientific evidence behind it that had been confirmed, that had accumulated over time, many people could see it. Lots of scientists would know about it. It wouldn't be one dude on TikTok it doesn't make any sense. On this podcast, Dr. Gundry goes as far as claiming that his system, his ideas, his diet can solve all diseases. Just think about the statement you're yeah, making. I you're saying you can eliminate you can. all disease. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Think about that for a second. Think about the implications of that. Every infection, every virus, every bacteria, every parasite, every pediatric disease, every cancer, every genetic disease, every congenital disease, everything would magically go away if only people would follow Dr. Gundry's diet. Dr. Gundry has difficulty backing up that claim, understandably, and so he refers to the incredible successes that he has in his practice. I get to watch miracles every day. This is great news for his patients, but Dr. Mike and Dr. Bellardo do a pretty good job of explaining the problem with this argument to defend a specific diet or a specific theory. Every health fluencer on the internet does this. Every low-fat guru, every low-carb guru, every vegan, every keto guru, they all list these anecdotes of their patients or their followers and how they're doing amazing to argue that their diet is the one. In fact, some of the exact same claims that Dr. Gundry makes on this podcast with the diet he recommends, which is a predominantly plant-based, low-lectin diet. There's tons of influencers making the exact same claims with very different diets. Diets that are low in plants, low in fiber, others that are high in lactin foods, and everything else in between. So if we're going to look at anecdotes, which it's okay to do as long as we don't overclaim, we have to look at all anecdotes, not just this pocket over here and pretend everything else doesn't exist? Are there some common elements? Is it because all of these trendy diets get rid of ultra-processed foods? Or is it because they're all elimination diets, and so it makes it easier for people to lose weight? Or is it specific intolerances that people have, or is it something else? We can test these ideas properly and not jump straight to spraying an audience with a confident claim. So this, I think, is a very interesting realization because I think there's a notion on social media that there's a divide and it's between the low fat and the low carb, the vegans and the ketos. I don't think that's the divide at all. Dr. Gundry, for example, is very pro plants, not all plants, but in general, he's pro a plant centered diet. He even says on this podcast that he's kind of anti-meat. You, you forget, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of anti-meat. And yet his arguments are identical to a lot of other influencers who also rely on a lot of storytelling, but who happen to be pro-meat or pro-high lectin foods. I really honestly don't see a ton of difference between them, even though the specifics of the diets might differ. We looked at an example of this exact phenomenon some time ago. It was a debate on TV that was billed as this clash between the meat diet and the vegetable diet. And so they brought on somebody to argue each side. And as we saw on that video, they sounded identical, both making these exaggerated wild claims that were not supported by the evidence. 
So this divide that is ostensibly presented to us on social media, in my opinion, is not the real divide at all. The real divide is between storytelling on one hand and scientific evidence-based content on the other. If you look at communicators that aren't religiously devoted to one diet, BioLane, Brad Stanfield, Mario Kratz, Sigma Nutrition, Physionic, these are different people, different preferences, and yet their message is 95% the same on the fundamentals because it's based on balance of scientific evidence. It's not based on an anecdote that they heard somewhere or a food that they happen to like. Now, really interesting to observe that these guys are good with the science, but they're not the most popular communicators. Storytelling based content tends to be more popular. And this is the biggest takeaway in terms of what can we learn from all this? And I have a feeling that looking at storytelling with arrogance, with disdain, like it's beneath us, is a fatal mistake. All humans are attracted to storytelling. It's engaging. Listen to Dr. Gundry and then Dr. Bellardo speak right after each other. Let's take Sardinia, for example, one of the blue zones. Only the people who live up in the mountains actually have longevity. The people who live down by the water don't. What's different about those people is that they are sheep herders and goat herders. And what they eat is a large amount of fermented sheep cheese, sheep yogurt. And what makes them have... So we want to look at randomized controlled trials where you're actually randomizing people to a certain dietary intervention and then evaluating them based on a placebo control. Then we have long-term epidemiological studies because you can't randomize someone to something for 15 years. But then we have large cohort data for nutrition epi where we look at the effects of the intakes at certain... Dr. Gundry is a really captivating speaker. He's a great storyteller. You want to hear where the story goes or how it ends. It's captivating. Dr. Bellardo's explanation scientifically is textbook, but it sounds boring in comparison, right? Almost robotic. And this is a big problem that we have society-wide. Most great scientists are not good at talking directly to the public. They're not good storytellers. And most people who have that skill, who are very adept communicators, don't have a strong scientific background. There are very few exceptions that overlap. In fact, scientists are trained to do almost the opposite to speak to other specialists in this lingo, in this technical terminology, and unemotionally. So I think it's on scientists, it's on the scientific community to be humble, to recognize that we suck at this, and to roll up our sleeves and learn. Learn from people who are good at it. People like Dr. Stephen Gundry. Here's that previous video on that TV debate, and here's more information on lectins and how to prepare your beans safely. I'll meet you over there.